Hi everybody, this is Mary Gannon with the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife. And this is the first of three tutorial videos for our Keeping the Balance Kit as part of our Roadie Critter Kits program. And this kit focuses on human and wildlife interactions and how those interactions have changed over time, how human activities have impacted our wildlife populations and how we are learning from our past mistakes and how we uh, manage and conserve wildlife today so that we have a nice sustainable uh, source of wildlife resources, whether that's for uh, game management or even non-game management as well, um, just for viewing wildlife um, and not using wildlife as a, as a consumable resource. Uh, so this is a really interesting kit. It has a lot of different aspects to it uh, that kind of tie into our other kits as well, if you've borrowed our other kits before. And there's a lot of cross-cutting concepts. So this is a, a cool way to connect science with history and social studies. Uh, so you could use this kit pretty much anywhere uh, in, in your curriculum. Uh, so for this lesson, we're gonna go through the um, events that you'll see as part of the timeline activity used in lesson one. So just to give you some background information, I'm gonna show my notes here on the side, which um, you'll be able to access as you look at this PowerPoint as well, uh, if you need to review uh, before you implement that activity. So our first uh, event on our timeline, uh, we start prior to the year 1600. And uh, in North America, indigenous people were exclusively living here. They farmed, they hunted, uh, they were trapping uh, animals for fur, uh, they fished for survival, and every piece of that animal was utilized, whether it was for tools or for clothing, for food. Um, just a, a huge reliance on wildlife resources for survival. And uh, this is a cool way to incorporate some social studies right into your uh, lesson here, talking about who were the indigenous people who lived in Rhode Island and who still live here. Uh, so it's not just the Narragansett tribe, uh, which many of us are very familiar with the Narragansett tribe uh, because many, uh, Many places, of course, the town of Narragansett is named after the tribe, but also the Wampanoag, Niantic, Nipmuc, Manasean, and Pequot tribes all utilized wildlife resources and natural resources here in Rhode Island. Uh, and members of these tribes are still here today. Uh, so this is something to connect, you know, not to only just to history, but also to how are people still maintaining those traditions and that connection to the land today. Um, and of course, the, the most iconic um, use of natural resources for Northeastern tribes is uh, wampum. So we have, uh, these are quahog shells uh, with the purple and the white used uh, for decoration and for, um, for beadwork, but also the quahog was consumed as well, a very important resource uh, in our marine fisheries. So enter Europeans here in 1636. The first European settlement is uh, started in Rhode Island by Roger Williams. And uh, this is when things start to change and how we, see, um, how we see how wildlife is being utilized with the arrival of the Europeans and more people on the landscape. So in 1740, we flash forward a little bit, uh, there's extensive European settlement. And uh, of course, people were clearing land for farms. And uh, so we saw a lot of removal of forest habitat for agriculture as well as over hunting and over trapping of game uh, because the Europeans were coming from places where wildlife was not a public resource. It belonged to the crown and you could not just go out and, and hunt and fish. Uh, you, would be, you would be breaking the law if you did that. Uh, you were you know, hunting in the king's forest, so to speak. Uh, so to come to a new place where nobody particularly owned the wildlife and it was a public resource was new for them and they saw that there was this abundance of uh, wildlife and, and fish uh, here in North America. So it was seemingly endless. So they just decided, oh, well, we'll just, you know, hunt and trap and have no problem, you know, sustain ourselves and also send those products back to Europe uh, for monetary gain. So that's a big problem, um, you know, seemingly endless resource, but it's really not an endless resource. And uh, we also saw a lot of, um, removal of predators such as wolves and mountain lions. So here in the Northeast, we used to have wolves and mountain lions as part of our natural landscape, but 
but because of widespread eradication, they put bounties on these animals. Uh, you could make money off of hunting wolves and turning them in. Uh, we lost those animals from the landscape. We lost our top predators. And this is a problem on an ecosystem level because we need our top predators. They're very important to keep the ecosystem functioning in a healthy way. Um, but we even lost things you know, like deer and wild turkey, um, which are outrageously abundant today. It's hard to imagine Rhode Island without deer or wild turkey. We see them in our, in our backyards and, and even in the city. But uh, because of this extensive overhunting, it was very difficult to find a deer at one point in Rhode Island. And we have some photos throughout the presentation uh, of these are not paintings or, or, um, uh, or pieces of art per se. They're actually photographs of dioramas uh, created by uh, the Harvard forest. So these are little dioramas that were created to represent different stages of New England's forest uh, throughout time. So if we jump forward to the year 1800, the American black bear completely disappears from Rhode Island due to that deforestation, predator persecution, and overhunting. So the top map is showing us the distribution of American black bear prior to European settlement and then after European settlement. Um, so now this is kind of an older map because it's showing you know, a good chunk of Southern New England does not have bears in this map. Uh, nowadays, we do have bears. Uh, they have returned and, and Southern New England has a healthy bear population now. So this could be updated a little bit, but it is showing you know, that, that major decline uh, and that, that's across the country where black bears were once very populous. Just a few more years later in 1830, we start to see peak levels of deforestation. This, this is what the Rhode Island landscape looked like, very, very different um, than when we started. Uh, and it, there was a time where there was pretty much no forest in Rhode Island. And you could see all the stone walls here. Um, and if you've been in the woods, you know, you've noticed stone walls running through the forest. Uh, these are the remnants of the old farms and the, the paddocks that they built with the stones that they filled up from the, from the ground. So that's showing you some clues as to the landscape's history, but kind of a fun thing to do if you have an area that you can go, um, you know, explore a wooded area with your students, uh, challenge them to look for these stone walls and, and see what may have happened um, in the schoolyard. Also in, in this time period, we started to see market hunting uh, become very popular, particularly for waterfowl um, and, and other birds as well. Uh, but this led to the overharvest of many bird species and huge population decline. So these are all ducks that are hanging here on the side of this boat and they would use a very large um, version of a shotgun. So today, today's hunters use a shotgun uh, that spreads, you, you know, the little pellets, and that's what um, that's what will take the the duck that they are uh, shooting at. Um, they the market hunters would use a very large version of it. Almost looks like a little cannon that would sit in the boat, um, and it would just fire out over a pond or a marsh, and it could kill a hundred ducks in one shot. So not very sustainable. Uh, method of hunting uh, because you're taking out far too many animals out of the population at once and they were doing this you know every few days uh, going out and and hunting the birds to sell at market as part of their livelihood this is not subsistence hunting this is i'm trying to make a profit off of hunting so in the year 1900 in response to severe declines of wildlife species and also this market system of purchasing wildlife the lacy act which is the first federal legislation for wildlife was signed. So this act made it unlawful to import, export, sell, acquire, or purchase fish, wildlife, or plants that are taken, possessed, transported, or sold. So essentially it's against the law to start selling wildlife and to, uh, to harvest it for uh, economic gain, which is great. That's a huge step forward uh, because people had not really thought about conservation of resources uh, as, as public resources or uh, just for conservation's sake. Um, this is, it's, it's very exciting to see this start to happen and we're gonna see a turn of, um, of focus as we move forward into the 1900s. This is kind of our, our tipping point in, in our change of, of heart and of uh, mindset. By 1910, here in New England, farms were in, increasingly abandoned because People were moving into cities uh, for work. They moved westward. 
uh, for better farming opportunities because here in rocky old New England, it's not maybe not the best uh, farming uh, opportunity that you could possibly get. So they were moving westward, moving across the frontier. Um, so because of that, forests began to regenerate and uh, were logged subsequently for timber, as we see some white pine back here, um, which is a favorable timber species. So we have we have some you know, some regeneration and some harvest. So there's still disturbance on the landscape, but the forest is starting to creep back into uh, Southern New England. In 1918, on the coattails of the Lacey Act, we start to see the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And this we cover extensively in our Feathered Friends Kit. Uh, but the act essentially put a stop to anyone having any bird feathers, eggs, parts of birds, uh, you know, purchasing parts of birds, uh, killing, possessing, selling, purchasing, bartering, importing, exporting, transporting uh, migratory birds. So th this took birds pretty much off the table. Um, you know, it, 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 the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is fairly strict in that, um, you know, maybe you're not killing a bird to put on a hat uh, because this was a, a big to do, you know, not only for market hunting for food, but also market hunting for the hat traits. These are egret feathers from the great egret, a very common wading bird in our salt marshes today. Uh, but they were, you know, stuff a whole bird, taxidermy an entire bird and put it on top of a hat, uh, all different species of birds. Uh, eggs were also a, a commodity. People would go out into gull colonies and which, where gulls will nest on the ground and just pick up a bunch of eggs and clean out the whole colony. Um, again, not very sustainable for, you know, populations continuing uh, because animals need to reproduce and to be able to replenish themselves. Uh, so this was in response to severe declines of many different bird species. And it was a movement led by women um, to kind of make each other aware of the cruelty of the fashion industry and what was going on at the time. Uh, so this also you know, protects birds from disrupting nests. Uh, so moving, picking up a, a nest or removing a nest of a bird uh, that might be nesting on your porch or whatever, wherever it may be, is a, technically against the Migratory Bird Treaty Act because that bird is protected um, if it is a migratory bird, a songbird, or any, any bird, really. There are some exceptions to this rule, of course, uh, with uh, waterfowl and upland game birds. And that exception is that you can only harvest those animals or those species in a certain season, and you can only take a regulated number of birds. So you can't just go out and shoot 100 ducks. You have a bag limit that is for the day. And there's even a possession limit that you could. So if you have you know, a dozen ducks that you've already harvested and they're sitting in your freezer at home, and you can only harvest so many more until you've consumed those. Uh, so you can't hoard, <laughs> you know, uh, hoard uh, any uh, game species as well. Uh, for things like wild turkey, the bag limit per season is two for the state. Uh, so each hunter can only take two birds a, a season, and that's a very short window that's only really two months out of the year in the spring. Uh, so any violation of those uh, regulations is a violation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, because we only hunt during certain seasons when birds are not rearing young, when they're migrating. Um, you know, that we're in the fall and the winter is really when you're targeting uh, game species so that that gives them the opportunity to reproduce and to do what they need to do to be sustainable populations. Uh, so this is an excellent, excellent progression uh, in the conservation movement. 1934, uh, also along those lines, so President Franklin D. Roosevelt signs the Duck Stamp Act, and this is the uh, first duck stamp. So it's a little tiny piece of art uh, that people do collect just for the artwork uh, itself. But this requires all waterfowl hunters ages 16 and up to purchase a federal duck stamp each year. And that's in addition to your hunting license. So here in Rhode Island, you buy your hunting license, you buy your federal duck stamp, and you also buy a Rhode Island duck stamp. And the purchase of the duck stamp, 98 cents out of every dollar, goes into conserving wetland habitat on our national wildlife refuge system. So this is amazing because it not only benefits the ducks that the hunters would like to go out and continually you know, hunt ducks every year and have that tradition. Um, but it also benefits any other critter that is living in those wetlands, which is excellent. So that's other things like wading birds, uh, reptiles and amphibians, 
fish, insects, things that we don't hunt, but are still going to benefit from that habitat conservation. So this is a really, really great uh, program that's still in effect today. There's an art contest every year um, to get your painting on the duck stamp. It's a really, really cool program. Uh, and there's a youth, um, a youth uh, duck stamp competition as well. So if you have any young artists who uh, would like to do some wildlife art, there's a competition that they can enter and try to get their, their duck on the duck stamp. In 1935, here in Rhode Island, we started our Division of Fish and Game, uh, which included law enforcement officers. So this is big because that's, you know, not only writing game laws and being like, okay, well, we have to make sure that we follow them, but having somebody to enforce those and making sure that it's a priority to enforce those. Um, so in, in 1978, we split into the Division of Fish and Wildlife, where I work, and then the Division of Law Enforcement would be its own division. Um, as, as we have them today. In 1937, FDR also signed the, probably the most critical wildlife legislation there is uh, currently. Uh, and hopefully we'll, of course, see more important wildlife legislation in the future. But this one right here, the Pittman-Robertson Act is so incredibly important to what we do at Fish and Wildlife uh, here in Rhode Island and across the country. Now it's known as the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. If you see this logo anywhere uh, on our properties, you know that that's um, what's at work uh, there on the property. But basically what the Pittman-Robertson Act did was it placed an excise tax on firearms, ammunition, and then extended to archery equipment later on as archery became more uh, popular. And the proceeds of that excise tax are paid if that's paid by the manufacturers of those items, that's allocated out to different all of the states, and we are mandated to use it for a very specific list of uh, things that we can do. So it's used for monitoring and research of wildlife species, specifically birds and mammals, because this is aimed at restoring and conserving game populations because theoretically this would be paid for by hunters when they purchase their shotgun, their ammunition that they're, they're gonna use that year, um, if they're gonna buy a bow and arrows uh, to go hunting so that the hunters would be directly putting funding into conserving the species that they are pursuing. So then that way it's sustainable they're able to continue to go hunting every year. We take care of those populations of those animals and uh, it's just a really nice user pay system. Um, so it focused initially on birds and mammals because those are the, the species that we would be um, using as a, as, as, as a consumptive uh, use of wildlife. Um, but now nowadays, you know, it's, it's hunters who pay into it, but it's also folks who just go target shooting. Uh, you know, for example, I do not hunt, but I, love archery. Target archery is super fun. Uh, for me, it's a fun activity that I enjoy. I bought a bow and some arrows. And so I have effectively contributed to the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Uh, so this is critical, critical. Um, and it's utilized, so I'll scroll down so you can also see these notes as well. So the United States Fish and Wildlife Service uh, directs all of the, the allocation of the funds. So we use it for management and restoration. We use it for research and monitoring of wildlife species, we use it for habitat acquisition. So a good chunk of our state lands in our state management area system was purchased with this money. And again, just like the duck stamp, you know, we're purchasing it for public land for hunters to be able to go out and to hunt every year, but also whatever is living on that property is going to benefit from the habitat. Um, we also use it for hunter education um, and also for the wildlife outreach program. We, we do a lot of uh, outreach and education on uh, WISFER, or Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration funded projects, which is quite a lot of what we do at Fish and Wildlife. In 1956, we started a formal hunter education program. And this is really important because, you know, people were just kind of passing down those traditions and those methods of hunting. Um, but, you know, having a formal program to ensure that people were going out and being safe and ethical uh, while out hunting is critical. So that started in 1956. These photos are not from 1956. It's, it's tough to find old photos, but you know, we've got some, some vintage photos from our Hunter Ed program uh, through the years. In 1960, we saw a new critter on the landscape, the Eastern Coyote. 
Uh, so as I said before, uh, we lost wolves and mountain lions. Those were our top predators that opened up a niche for another top predator. And we have a cool map going on here. So this dark orange section here is the historical range of the eastern coyote, or of, of the coyote. Um, eastern coyotes are technically a, a subspecies of coyote. Uh, so the historical range is in the Great Plains area. You know, they go down into Mexico, a little bit up into Canada. Um, but as we lost wolves, people started moving west and we started seeing railroads and wagon trains and you know more traffic out there on the Great Plains. Coyotes are very opportunistic and they're very smart. So they said, oh, we see the people dropping all of their trash, there's livestock, this is easy picking. So they would kind of follow those pathways of humans and expand their range throughout North America. So you can see that you know, they, there was an expansion going northwards, going through the southeast, even moving westward and going up. So now you can find coyotes all the way up in Alaska um, and they're pretty, much, they're pretty much in every state um, and they are perfectly comfortable living around people. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're, they're out in the woods, but they're also, you know, in our neighborhoods, our cities, picking through trash cans and, and whatnot. Um, but this, this is a, an example of how human activities can influence our ecosystem. So when you pull out one top predator, you're making room for technically coyotes are not a top predator in their historic range where they, where they overlapped with wolves. Wolves are the top predator and coyotes are, are next in, in line. You know, they're, they're lower there um, and, they're, and wolves will actually uh, you know, pick on coyotes that will be in their, in their territory. So they have to uh, obey the top predator there. Um, but when you remove that top predator, you open up opportunity for the smaller predators to, uh, to fill that niche. Uh, so coyotes aren't, aren't, um, the, as, aren't the same as wolves. They do eat deer, uh, but they're not taking down, you know, large prey like, like wolves would be. Um, you know, in other parts of the country, like bison and elk, you know, coyotes are not taken down an elk. Uh, but uh, here in the Northeast, you know, they do eat deer. They are a little bit larger than their Western counterparts. And they do have a little sprinkling of wolf and domestic dog DNA that does not make them hybrids. They are not wolf coyote hybrids. We do not have koi wolves here in Rhode Island. Uh, that's a common, uh, common misconception. And we'll talk about coyotes extensively in uh, lesson three. There's a, we use the coyote as a case study um, for lesson three, but uh, this is just a, a really interesting example of seeing how nature reacts to uh, what, people, what people are doing. In 1973, we had the Endangered Species Act, which I'm sure most people have heard of, even students have probably heard of it. Um, so that's further protecting America's endangered and threatened wildlife and their habitats. Um, and that's through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So the bald eagle is, you know, obviously our national bird and is probably one of the most iconic species that benefited from the Endangered Species Act. And now we've, we've seen, you know, bald eagles return to Rhode Island uh, because of protections uh, put in place by uh, the ESA. In 1976, we start to see beavers return to Rhode Island. So back at the time of the colonists, the beavers are being very heavily trapped for their fur uh, because it's a very thick, warm, waterproof fur. So indigenous peoples prized beaver fur uh, for, uh, for clothing and also utilize the animal for food as well. But uh, when the Europeans got here, they were so excited because they had pretty much eradicated all of their beavers in, in Europe in pursuit of that very fluffy fur. Um, so it took a very long time for them to come back. They are now in every watershed in the state and they're doing very well, so well that we've been able to reenact a, uh, or reinstate, excuse me, reinstate a uh, trapping season on beavers, a regular, a regulated trapping season uh, to actually kind of keep their populations in check a little bit. So they're doing really, really well. This is a very important uh, animal on our, on our landscape because they affect uh, wetlands and they create wetland habitat for other animals. In the year 2000, we saw the addition of state wildlife grants. So as I said before, in 1937, the Pittman-Robertson Act was only focusing on birds and mammals. But as we know, of course, wildlife is not just birds and mammals, it's insects, it's amphibians, it's reptiles, um, it's all sorts of different things. So 
in the year 2000, the state wildlife grants are established and they're going to support the conservation of species, greatest conservation need. So in order to receive this funding, each state has to create a wildlife action plan and then you revise it every 10 years. Um, so we're, we're up for revision for our, uh, almost, almost there for our, um, for our 2015 action plan. And essentially what the action plan does is it identifies those species that are in need of the most help. Uh, so of greatest conservation need. That include birds, mammals, invertebrates, uh, both in terrestrial and aquatic. Uh, we have fish on there and reptiles and amphibians. And what it'll do is it'll look at those species, it'll look at what the threats are to those species and then determine the actions that we need to take as a state in order to prevent further loss of those species. So this could be something that's already endangered in the state, uh, or it could be something that is maybe fairly common but could become endangered due to a number of factors. Uh, so the, the goal is always to prevent something from becoming endangered uh, before it comes becomes endangered uh, because it's much easier to uh, to do that than to try to backtrack and, and save the animal once the population has grown so low. Uh, we also identify habitats of greatest conservation need as well in the action plan. And then that brings us up to present day. So the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife, we continue to protect, restore, and manage our wildlife populations and their habitat through a number of different projects uh, that you can learn about in our roadie critter kit. So that brings us through our timeline uh, activity to give you a little bit more in-depth background information so that you can uh, use this with your students and uh, learn a little bit about history in, in the context of uh, the Northeast and across the country.